it's quite popularly used for adornment, but underlying that is a monetary function, it's a store of value. And in going on to slide six here, yeah, we touched upon it earlier about it being uh, fu uh, fungible and uh, interchangeable. But gold is, is an objective unit of measure. An ounce of gold is an unchanging unit regardless of the location where it's held or the time period that it was first created in. So even today, in our world of, of, fi of fiat currencies, and I put mainly valueless because there really isn't much backing them other than a, a system of trust which is very fragile and which, as we've seen in, in past history, that, that system of trust can break down. And you know, when it does, you're essentially left with paper, and that's it. It doesn't really serve any real any purpose anymore. But even today, in, in our world of fiat currencies, every human being, regardless of where they are, knows that, knows that gold has value. And they're willing to accept it in economic transactions. Uh, good example, an ounce of gold today is about $1,350 an ounce. And if I uh, happen to owe somebody uh, the equivalent of that amount, say, or even double that amount, say $2,700, somebody painted my house, I need to pay them $2,700. I don't have that cash to hand, but I've got two one ounce coins. If I show that guy that that's worth $2,700, uh, nine times out of 10, the guy's gonna take it because he knows he can get something with it. He can take that gold, turn it into cash, turn it into whatever else he wants, sure. It's not as convenient as having paper in your pocket because most people are used to accepting that. They don't, they don't really have to think too hard about it or receiving it when they receive the paper. But yeah, put a, gold, put a couple of gold coins in somebody's hands and they realize, okay, I've got something here. This is value and th this is timeless. Nothing has changed whether you look at it today, 50 years ago or 500 years ago. Going on, and finally to get onto the word uh, digital, and uh, we first of all just to set some context we live in a digital era it's amazing that you know i can sit here and talk to you i'm you know thousands of miles away from where you guys are we're essentially uh speaking to each other here in real time so you know computers and communication technologies are basically enabling us to exchange and, and, and interact unlike any other time in the history of mankind and it's this digital era this digital facility that we have now is very important and is what essentially enables this concept of uh, digital gold currency to exist. And by digital, the way I use the term specifically here in digital gold currency is really just a simple uh, electronic in, in contrast to physical. So digital means essentially a, um, a electronic representation of a physical object that we can measure and weigh and, 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 and you know, that, that can be used in a monetary purpose and uh, way of calculating value. So going on to the next slide here, what does, uh, what is DGC exactly? It, from digital gold currency is essentially the electronic representation of physical gold. That's it. You've got gold and it has a certain form of value and you use the digital form of it to, uh, to move it around without having the, the cumbersome process of actually having to move physical metal around. It's easy enough to pay somebody in your neighborhood that's done some work for you with a gold coin, but it's not so easy to do that to someone you need to pay 50 miles away or 5,000 miles away. So what DGC, Digital Gold Currency, enables is the communication of value worldwide using an objective unit of measure, which is gold. So, you know, to, to the point being is that digital gold currency can be used on any scale. It can be a small community of people, a town, a state, a country, to an entire marketplace, you know, globally, across, where, where distance really doesn't matter at that stage. Going to um, slide nine, what I wanted to do is just show you a couple visuals to try and put it into context. So what I would like to do is explain how it would work in a very, very simple level and you know take it up one step further and then based on that you can extrapolate the rest i think uh, first of all how does dgc work um, I mean, from a, what i would call a local um, a local uh, level you basically have somebody that's going to issue the digital gold currency though so there's going to be somebody responsible for providing a platform for the transfer of gold value to happen for all the participants in that platform. So I call that person the DGC operator. They're the ones that you know, have to arrange to have the metal stored 
and provide a platform, a software platform for the exchange of that metal value to happen for all its participants. And you know, under working with the operator underneath it are the, the various digital gold currency holders. These are people like you and me that will basically want to transact with gold with each other have, and be able to do that in an easy way through the digital gold currency operator. A couple things to point out about this slide here. First is that all three of these participants, and you know, when I say three, obviously the holders can be a much larger number of people underneath the operator. But from this basic point, it's, it's three participants. All three of them can be in the same physical location. They can be in the same town or they could be a community of people stretched out across the world. They might have some common interest. You know, it could be, um, it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, from a, a practical point of view in the online world, people that like to play online games. And, uh, you know, th this is a means for them to actually transfer value for to each other to play the game, things of that nature. Uh, so by local, I don't necessarily mean it in just, you know, the same physical space, but a local community uh, from a virtual point of view as well. Uh, going on to slide, uh, excuse me, 10, yes. What I'd like to extrapolate here is if you, if you look in this slide, what we're really doing is taking the local version of digital gold currency where you have a, the di a digital gold currency operator and its various uh, users, holders underneath it, and linking them together. Um, what, what I want to express here basically is that you could have a small local community of people using gold in one place, let's say, uh, you know, one town in one part of your state, and then you know, 100 miles away, you may have another town where there's a separate digital gold currency operator and a separate group of people using it. So, you know, how does somebody in the first place, you know, that holder 1A in the diagram down on the bottom left, how would he actually pay somebody that happens to be 100 miles away from him? that holder 2B down at the bottom right of the diagram. Yeah, it's, it can be done quite simply through a, a clearing network between the various digital gold currency operators. So you have the operator holding the gold in, in a specific place, providing the software for these guys within his local community to transact. Up above him is a, is a gold currency clearer that would basically clear transactions between the various operators. So if, if holder 1A down in the bottom left wants to make a payment to holder 2B, the operators linked through a clear can essentially facilitate this transfer of value uh, within a second or two. This, this is not unlike the way um, traditional bank networks clear between each other, but it's done in real time at a much faster pace and using a real store of value and a real monetary unit, which is gold. Uh, the final piece I want to bring up on this slide, just to put it to perspective, if you look at the bottom left where you have the DGC operator one and it's two customers underneath it, it's two users underneath it. That's very similar, that, that's, a micro, that's a, basically the representation of the local slide that I showed you earlier. Now if you go up the level above, you have the DGC clearer and the DGC operators underneath it. Essentially that's the same grouping of three like we saw in the previous slide. This can scale up several levels so that regardless of the amount of different uh, networks of people using gold as a mechanism for payment amongst each other, there can be multiple levels of clearing and that can be way more efficient in, in, in several different ways. This is looking out into the future a bit more when it's used more widely, but there is a basis for it to work on that level and for the transfer of value to happen pretty much anywhere that it needs to and probably clear up through no more than two, three different levels of, of clearing uh, mechanisms. Now, so this all conceptual, and um, I think hopefully I'm not, uh, you know, I'm making this clear about on a very basic level how this can work. There's obviously some more detail to it, but I'm not going to give that to you this evening. But what I do want to do is take you to slide 11 here, just to you understand the basic ingredients that make digital gold currency work. And they are very few, uh, but and, and quite simple to, to understand from a high level. The first and most important is safe, safe storage for the gold itself. You know, this could be anything from a high security vault that you know, holds billions of dollars of equivalent value of it, or something as simple as a trusted storage party. By that, I mean, if we're talking a local community of a few hundred people, it might be a, a trusted party within the town that has a, a, a vault facility that can store 
a few hundred thousand dollars worth of gold or something on, on that kind of a scale. So uh, first and most part, importantly is storage for the gold. Second is uh, a transaction platform so you can actually move that gold. And you know this is the digital element of it. It could be a database of debits and credits. Everybody has an account. They move those the debits and credits between each other uh, through the, the uh, transaction platform. Or it could be issued tokens, um, which is more like the digital representation of cash, uh, which is a, another sort of mechanism that you can use to essentially create the equivalent of digital gold coins and pass them around uh, electronically. And with you have more of the properties of cash, which can be semi-anonymous, um, for it, which from a, from a privacy point of view is beneficial to some people. Uh, and finally, the third part, the third part of the uh, ingredients is the client tools. This is your personal computer, your smartphone, like your BlackBerry, your iPhone, uh, and or possibly in some cases, if necessary, even even paper notes, uh, storage certificates, as it were. Some people may not have a computer, may not want to use a smartphone or whatnot to transact. If they still want some kind of representation of real metal, um, the issuer or the the provider of the safe storage and the transaction platform can work together and produce paper notes if necessary for people in the community that wouldn't want to actually have a digital uh, transaction platform to use. These are the basic ingredients here, and from a very um, from a very high high level. One, one point about the safe storage for gold, just to tie the whole thing home, somebody can have a gold coin, a uh, bar of gold stored in a vault, and from a very simple point of view, you, you want to know that that's there. How do, you, how do you audit that? It could be something as simple as the storage facility provides a camera showing you all the value that's held there. Uh, independent users for somebody can go in and count it, make sure there's always a one-to-one -one ratio of metal that's being held in the vault to metal that's circulating electronically through the, the digital gold currency system that's being used. I bring this point about audit up because at the end of the day, the money that you're using to transact, you want to be sure it's there. We don't want to be back in the position where you know, somebody gets tempted to go and start putting out more digital units of gold currency than actually exist, uh, exist in the vault. So I, one of the key mechanisms, I should say key uh, um, controls in a digital gold currency system is uh, auditability uh, whenever and wherever the users of that system want it. That's a key principle that yeah, I wanted to bring up here. And if, if just going to the, uh, the last slide here, slide number 12, advantages of gold, a digital gold currency. There's really two. The, the first one is instant and complete settlement of transactions. It's not just the speed at which it's settled, but it's also the finality of the transaction. If I give you a $100 bill, you're getting a piece of paper that's a promise to eventually pay someday uh, $100, which is nothing more than representation of a bank loan that was created out of thin air. I get that piece of paper, I receive a liability of a bank that may or may not be able to give me any value for that money when I take it to them and ask for it. We're in the position today that's even more one more step to remove. There's nothing of value to take back anymore. In the old days, at least when you had a, a dollar note, but it was representing some, some amount of gold or silver that was essentially giving that note value. We're even further away from it now. Transacting in gold in real time is a complete and, a complete and immediate settlement of, of, uh, of the transaction because the, the movement of ownership from uh, person A to person B is transacted in seconds. And also, you're dealing with an asset currency. You're dealing with real money. It's something that is, is ultimately, in, it, in and of itself, intrinsically valuable. So there is no remaining, uh, there is no liability in that, in that settlement of, of uh, the transaction. And most importantly, I think the, the real advantage of digital gold currency is independence. Any community, large or small, can use digital gold currency and they don't need to rely on some financial institution or government entity to enable that for them. All you really need, you saw in my ingredients slide um, just previously, is a place to store the gold, a transaction platform that can be done, the software that makes this available, or makes this possible is available today. It's, it's out there, it's been written, and it, it, it's, 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 it's incredibly easy to use. And finally, just uh, some software and, and uh, a computer device of your own. It's something that essentially 
anybody can do, a community, large or small, can, can start using it and empower themselves with real money to transact in real value. So that's it for my presentation right now. I've probably gone just a little bit over my time. I'm sorry for the extra delay, but yeah, thank you for your attention, and I hope this was uh, useful to everybody. Jeffrey, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Jeff, hang on, okay. I'll point toward the crowd, point the lens. So, because he can't see anything but the podium. So give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A couple things that one thing he, he addressed, and he didn't say to use the word, but he does that to solve the problem of the fractional reserve system the banks are currently using, having a one to one ratio. I think that's pretty clear to everyone. Coming out again tonight and being here, it's a wonderful occasion, and we are all trying to be educated more on this monetary thing. Reminds me of a story and a joke I heard one time. It was about the uh, camels. Baby camel looks over at Mama Camel and he says, why do we have these three web feet like we do? And she said, because we go through the desert and the sand is soft and it's sifting and it gives us stability and we're able to do what we're doing to get through the desert. He says, uh, why do we have these long eyelashes? And she says, going through the desert, we've got wind storms and the sand storms and they blow up and they can't help protect our eyes from the sand. And he says, why do we have these humps on our back? And she says, because we need the water to be able to get through the desert on the long treks we take. He looks at her and he says, why are we in the zoo? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of reminds me of where we are in this nation right now. I'm not sure we're on the right track, ladies and gentlemen. We need to get our act back together. Remember, we are $14 trillion in debt. Federal deficit, what is that? $225,000 per family or per household. That's a lot of money. Uh, we need to get back to the right situation, ladies and gentlemen, to quit spending and to, and to save some of these monies because we are wasting our posterity because we're trying to make our prosperity at this time for the future better. Uh, I'm not going to uh, introduce Larry Franks but uh, my friend from Missouri, who just happened to be one of our the masses. <clears throat> Doug is an author and a pastor. I thought he was the one that wrote that great song sung by George Beverly Shea. Uh, was, uh, I'd rather have a monetary, about the monetary system and how the traditions of uh, man have um, come to show our honest money was something very different. First, I'd like to ask uh, the daughters, Allison and uh, Emily, if they'd stand up so we I want to ask uh, Doug Jayden if he would to come up and introduce uh, Dr. Larry Parks, and would you give him a warm South Carolina? The South Carolina Sound Money Committee for giving me a chance to share my heart for a few minutes before I introduce somebody who I have the utmost respect for. Um, why on earth would I drive 850 miles in uh, early February to come and be at a conference here? And the reason is those two girls in the back. Um, what we have before us, folks, is a point-in-time opportunity, and a, it's, it's a point-in-time opportunity that isn't going to last very long, but in the next several years, what happens in this nation is going to set the foundation for the, the world and the country that they live in. And there are a lot of things that are going on that are changing. Lots of changes going on, and, and we're seeing the, the political grassroots awaken and address some of these very, very important issues that need to be addressed in this country. How many of you are familiar with the Tenth Amendment Center? Heard of the Tenth Amendment Center? I kind of figured most of you did. What we have going on here is there's an awakening in, in, at the grassroots level of this issue of sound money, this issue of honest money that, that's coming to the forefront. It's about where it is today, where, where the Tenth Amendment Center and states' rights issues were a couple of years ago. It's really starting to gain traction. People are becoming educated on the need for sound money, the need for honest money. And being a pastor, that's pretty near and dear to my heart. This whole issue of the, the honesty side of what we use to transact with one another, the foundation upon which uh, so much of what we do every day has to be built on something that has got longevity. And uh, you know, you'll learn more about the longevity, the constitutional issues behind that from, uh, from Dr. Parks and Dr. Vieira than you certainly will from me. 
But one of the things we need to take a, and really put deep in our hearts is the fact that there are the changes that are going on in this country are really on, on a three-legged stool. We have political changes that need to be made. We have economic slash monetary systems that need to be made. And they need to be buttressed and, and foundation built with a moral and a, an ethical change in how we are doing business with one another in this nation. And if we kick any of those legs of the stool out, the other two are not going to last. So our monetary system, as we go through and re reform our monetary system and build this economy that we need to have built on a solid foundation, it needs to have honest money in its foundation. And, and I, to that end, I wrote a book a few years ago in 2006 called Fool's Gold, How the Traditions of Men Have Replaced God's Honest Money. It takes a look at this system from a biblical perspective. And I had a chance in writing that book to meet Dr. Larry Parks. He helped me for about a year to to, to take a lot of the constitutional misconceptions that are out there about what money is and what the Constitution says about money and root them out of the book. He said, Doug, you got these things wrong. I said, well, thank you very much for, for pointing those out and helping me get them right. And the, the reason I'm telling you this story is at the end of the day, you know, like a lot of creative things that we come together and put together, we, we didn't see eye to eye on the very end product. And we parted ways. And Larry just, he had... He, had the best wishes for me and the book and really wanted it to, to do well, even though he poured a lot of his time into it. And you know what, folks? Not only is Dr. Larry Parks one of the most well-known and renowned scholars of constitutional sound money in the world, he's an honest man. He's a man of integrity. And it's these kind of people that we need to lead this charge. We need these kind of people to be leading the way in the reintroduction of sound, honest money in this country. And so it, without further ado, I, I am honored. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce to you Dr. Larry Parks. First, it's a real honor to present to the South Carolina Sound Money Committee, and many thanks to Doug for those very kind words. Uh, this press, uh, uh, do we have uh, slide one up, by the way? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, this presentation is in two parts. I'm going to do a part now, I'm going to do a part later, and there are three taking away points from this presentation. The first is that the monetary structure that we have now is not in accordance with the rule of law, which is to say it's not in accordance with our Constitution. The second point, takeaway point, is that the whole thing is dishonest. Now, in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to address those two issues. In this part of the presentation, I'm going to address the issue that the system's blowing up. And one of the reasons, perhaps the reason, to be absolutely 100% increasing the money supply. And any of you who have an engineering science education, as I did originally, know that any system that doesn't have a self-correcting mechanism blows up. Let's go to slide number two, please. This is one of the most important charts you will ever see in your life. It is the, and by the way, I have some stunning and shocking material to show you. This chart shows the price level in the United States from 1800, roughly the inception of our country, up until 2006. Now notice from 1800 up until slightly after World War II, the price level was fairly constant. You had a little blip around the War of 1812, a little blip around the Civil War, a little blip around World War I, but then after World War II, it continued to rise, and then after the 1970s, it just went into the stratosphere. Now the negative effect, I'm gonna talk for a, in just a minute about why that happened, but the negative effect is that it made America an expensive place to do business. So the first thing that happened in the early 1970s is that all of the labor-intensive manufacturing began to leave America. Things like garment manufacturing, uh, things like shoe manufacturing, and by the 1980s, the entire shoe industry left America. There's only one shoe factory left in the whole country. It's in the Northwest. It's called Edmund and Allen. I wear, Allen and Edmonds, I wear their shoes. But uh, along the way, whole industries left. The microwave, in microwave oven industry left. All the televisions left. And the spin that you got from Wall Street is that we would do the innovation, uh, we would do the inventing, whatever, 
and the people in asia would do the dirty work put the stuff together but really what's happened is that now companies like cisco i b m microsoft and others they're opening an r and d centers in india and china and japan and so what's happened as a result of this increasing price level we closed in america something like fifty some odd thousand factories and you have uh, something like sixteen twenty million people unemployed now and i'm going to show you in just a moment that the uh, defining event that happened here was that they broke the last tie to gold in August 15, 1971. Go to slide two, please. So coincident with that, you notice this is the increase in the broad money supply. It's called M3. The Federal Reserve stopped publishing this metric in 2006. They said it was too expensive for them to publish it. Can you imagine? But the money supply in this country went from roughly $150 billion in 1946 and as you can see, it started to speed up around the 1960s, early 1970s. That's when they were creating money out of nothing to finance the Vietnam War. But after the last tie to gold was broke, the, the amount of money in this country literally exploded. Now I want to address now, go to the next slide please. How did all this money get into the system? How do you go from 150 billion to 14 trillion? This is the part of the presentation that a lot of people have a great deal of difficulty with. And the way I like to explain it, there are certain concepts that we all hold very strongly. And the concept that all of us, cross culture, cross time, hold most strongly is what psychologists call gender identification. So from the time you're like two, three years old, people are telling you you're a little boy, you're a little girl. Nobody comes to you 30, 40, 50 years later telling you you're not a boy, you're a girl. Or you're not a girl, you're a boy. And everybody who's grown up with the irredeemable paper ticket money, they think that's the money. And the guy who really put his finger on this in a very uh, eloquent way, not on our side, was John Kenneth Galbraith, one of the most important economists of the 20th century. Uh, in, uh, uh, he, he died a few years ago. He was so important, his funeral was broadcast multiple times on CNN. He was a professor emeritus at Harvard, wrote 42 books. And one of these books is called Money. And here he talks about the process by which banks create money. He says it's so simple that the mind is repelled. And what is it that repels your mind? And you'll see in just a second, go to the next slide, please. I'm going to explain to you in very simple terms how the money gets created. So suppose, for example, you're going to buy a house for $350,000 and you need a $300,000 mortgage. And say that mortgage is a 30 year, 6% fixed rate mortgage. The interest on that is going to be $200,000. 270 some odd thousand over the 30 year period. Let's just call the interest 300 grand. And so you go to the bank, say I'm the bank, and uh, Citibank say, you say I want a $300,000 mortgage. We pass some papers back and forth, and I give you the mortgage. Where does Citibank get the money? And the answer is somebody goes to a computer keyboard, types three, and then uh, five zeros, and that's it. Six keystrokes and the $300,000 created to your account. And for doing those six keystrokes, now Citibank is going to get $350,000 in interest over a 30 year period. Now, could that possibly be in conformity with our Constitution? Could that possibly be honest? Now, suppose that wasn't a $300,000 loan. Say it was a $3 million loan, say for a commercial building, for which they'd get $3.5 million in interest. Well, what do they have to do to get the extra $3 million in change? And the answer, all they have to do is hit the zero key one more time. And if that was, say, a $30 million loan, say, for the Philippines, which they get $35 million in interest, what do they have to do to get the extra $32 million? And the answer, they have to hit the zero key one more time. This is simply outrageous. Now, this business of creating money out of nothing, just typing it into a computer, it's really a book entry. This is not a secret. Go to the next slide, please. The Federal Reserve, uh, through its... Uh, Every one of the regional Federal Reserve banks, 12 of them, plus the Board of Governors, has something they call the Public Information Department. Uh, to my mind, this is akin to Joseph Goebbels' Ministry of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. They're supposed to tell you how great the Federal Reserve is, what they're doing for us. In effect, they just uh, uh, spin. It's all spin in order to protect themselves. But some of their publications, they come clean. And in one of them, it's called The Story of Money It's Given to Its Children. And they tell you right out. They say money exists simply as a book.